So again, I want to start off this morning by thanking you for being here on this long weekend. We know that uh, many of us have plans and places that we'd like to be, and I just really appreciate the fact that you are here with us this morning. Uh, because people were going to be away, my, my plan this morning was kind of working around the idea that we're going to have people away. We've been working through a series together for the last little while, and I try to make it so that as few people miss out on this as possible. So this weekend, we're going to be hopping out of our series in Matthew together, and we're going to be back in it next week. We'll be in Matthew 19 together. But this week, uh, we're going to be hopping out of it, and we're going to be flipping forward into the book of Romans. Uh, you can see it up on the screen there, Romans 8.28. That's where we're going to be orbiting around this morning. If you've got a Bible with you, I invite you to turn there with me. But as you're doing that, I want to share a little something. You want to know what I'm really thankful for right now, aside from the fact that I've got a healthy family, that we have a home in this community, that we can be here together. One thing that I'm really, really thankful for this year is we're coming up to Thanksgiving. But some things that you are thankful for first. Sorry? Blood of Jesus, we are always thankful for the salvation that God offers. Happy family, absolutely. John? Good health. Beautiful weather. Man, mine's going to sound really petty compared to yours. <laughs> that God is in control, absolutely. One thing that I'm really, really, really grateful for right now is that after two years of living in isolation, being stuck at home and not being able to go anywhere, the world is starting to open up again, and we can start thinking about the, that, that word that I dared not speak because it was so fragile before, vacation. Very thankful that my family and I are starting to have that conversation around, okay, so it's been two years since we've gone anywhere, what do you want to do? McDonald's, nothing expensive. Like, <laughs> I love the planning phase of a vacation. I love the hope that it brings. I love just that, that feeling of euphoria as you look towards what it is that you're planning on doing, putting together an itinerary, getting ready and packing and all that kind of stuff, looking forward to the things that you want to do, picking the destination. You start dreaming about all the wonderful things that you want to be able to do while you're there. I love the planning phase of pretty much anything, but there's an old saying that should always be taken into consideration anytime you're planning a vacation, uh, a birthday party, a wedding, anything like that, any sort of a plan, something that you need to bear in mind as you're doing these things. No plan ever survived contact with the enemy. I mean, that's battle plans for the most part, but no plan ever survived contact contact with the enemy. The last time we went to go and visit my in-laws out in Kitimat, which was probably the better part of three years ago, something like that. It's been a while. Two years. It's been two years. The last time we went to go and visit my in-laws in Kitimat, we were excited because we love going to BC and we love spending time with my in-laws. And before we left on the trip, Nicola and I spent the week before we left planning and preparing for every possible contingency that could happen on the road. We were prepared for anything, or so we thought. Half an hour into our trip, we drive out there. We don't like taking a plane out there because, frankly, when you're at your in-law's place and there's only one vehicle, it feels a little bit like being 16 again. We're like, Mom, Dad, can I have the vehicle tonight? Not fun. So we, we rent a van and we go out there. And half an hour into our trip, we were having a good time. We were coming from Devon. We were on our way down the highway. We had just turned on to Highway 16. We were listening to our favorite radio program. Things were going great, and then it happened. We were prepared for anything that could have possibly gone wrong, except for the kids getting sick in the car. And we certainly were not prepared for the kids to get sick in the car three times. I'm going to spare you some of the gory details that go along with this, but suffice it to say, we were very, very grateful that it was a rental. <laughs> That's your problem, sir.
we were only half an hour out, and we were looking at the situation. We were considering, like, should we turn around? Like, are we going to be able to handle this? Is this something that we're going to be able to actually do? And as we were contemplating that turnaround, like, we, we got cleaned up. We pulled into Hinton. We were able to actually get the, the van, you know, moderately cleaned up. And then on our way out of Hinton, as we were going through Jasper, I asked my wife to look up something on the map to see how far away we were from our, next, our, our destination. She dug around in her pockets, and guess what she couldn't find? Her phone. And that led to pulling over on the side of the road and wondering whether or not we had left it in Hinton at the Walmart where we bought all the stuff that we cleaned the van out with, or whether or not it was splattered somewhere on the highway, or whether somebody had stopped and they gotten a free phone that day. But whatever the case was, it resulted in some hasty words between a husband and wife. It was not a good trip. We had left our house that morning believing that we were on top of everything, but by the time we pulled into our cabin, which by the way didn't have a laundry machine, you try going and washing some of that stuff out in the bathtub. When we left our house that morning, we believed that we were on top of everything, but by the time we pulled into our cabin for the night, we were haggard, stinking, and grumpy. We were a mess. We'd started with a vision of how our day was supposed to go, and by the time we ended up where we were going, we were so disappointed that we were still considering turning around and going home. Life has a way of taking our plans and throwing them out. Now, perhaps you can relate to this. I really hope that you can't relate to some of the details in my story because there's not a group for people like us. But maybe you've had your expectations let down in the past by someone or something. Maybe you've had your expectations failed. Maybe you've stepped out to try something new, trusting that it would work out, and then you ended up being disappointed. Maybe you've misunderstood an agreement or a deal, and things turned out much different than you expected them to, and it's left you asking questions. Misunderstanding the promises in the Bible can lead to disappointment and difficult questions. Even worse, if we understand the promises, of, if we misunderstand the promises of Scripture, not only do we risk having a very confusing time for ourselves, but we also risk causing damage to the people around us when we try to misapply truth from Scripture. However, if we can understand God's promises and His will for our lives, we can lean into those promises and find the peace and hope needed to endure any circumstances, no matter what life throws on us, and we can follow through with, with those circumstances with an authentic witness, with the authentic hope and peace that comes from following Jesus. We don't need to lean on empty promises. We've got the promises of Scripture, and those can strengthen us to come through anything if we understand them properly. So with that in mind, I want to turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 28. If you don't have a Bible with you, it'll be up on the screen. I'll be reading out of the NLT this morning. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, that is a verse that looks great in a greeting card or slapped on a coffee mug. That's some giftware Bible verses. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. Amen? Hopefully. It's a comfort and it's a truth from God's word, and so I'm in no way trying to disparage any hope or comfort that comes out of that verse, but it's also a promise that needs to be understood within the context of all Scripture. We can't just take it by itself, isolate it, put it on that coffee cup, and just trust that just that's going to be true. God makes all things work for the good of those who love Him, and I think a good way to frame this truth within the context of the entire Bible is by going with this, God is able to redeem all things. God is able to redeem all things. Now, I want to say this up front as clearly as possible. God loves you. 
I promise you that. God loves you, and it is not His desire to see anyone suffer. As a matter of fact, He loved us so much that He sacrificed Himself for us rather than see us suffer for eternity. He created this world to be good, and we are made for the purpose of enjoying creation in relationship with Him. That's our stated purpose. That was the manufacturer's warranty on us. Unfortunately, we live in a world that's been broken by our sin. And as a result of our rejection of God's will, we've been left to the consequences of our sin. We read earlier in Romans. God doesn't delight in suffering. At the same time, God's greatest purpose for us is not to eliminate suffering in this life. He's promised that in eternity for sure. But His greatest purpose now is not eliminating suffering in this life. His greatest purpose is to redeem His creation. Now, I believe that this passage is all about God's redemptive nature and how His power is so great that He can take the brokenness in our world the brokenness of our lives, the sin that we live in. And He can use it to reveal His love, His healing, and His salvation. This is central to our message and ministry as a church. God is not interested in our comfort or our prosperity. He may provide those things, but they're not promised. They're not His greatest purpose. God's purpose is redemption. Now, that's a big thing to claim, especially when you consider some of the horrors and the tragedies that people and nations can experience. But I believe it's true. And I want to demonstrate what it looks like for us to live within the truth that God is able to redeem all things. But before we go there, I want to highlight a couple of the ways that we can get this wrong. I'm going to highlight a couple of the ways that we may misunderstand this promise. Each of these misunderstandings is rooted in the belief that God is concerned with our comfort more than He is with our eternal destiny. It's rooted in the idea that God is more interested in our comfort than He is in redeeming what we've been through, the things that we've put others through, or the things that creation has thrown at us. First, there's the idea that this passage promises that people who love God are going to live charmed, comfortable lives. God causes everything to work together for our good, so it should logically flow from that that we're going to experience prosperity in our lives and freedom from hardship. Amen? Not so much. Anybody who has had that experience, stand on your head. That's a great sales tactic. That is an absolutely fantastic sales tactic, telling people that Jesus solves all your problems. It's a pretty common way of convincing people to buy products. Like, we've all been, we've all seen those commercials that come on late at night, those infomercials, a black and white image of some poor schmuck burning eggs on the the stove, just having a hard time trying to scrape whatever he's sacrificed in the sink. It's been cooking in what, you know, this, what we can generously call a conventional frying pan, and this is the source of his problems. And he's doing this while his life burns down around him because he cannot cook a decent breakfast for his family. And you look at that image and you're like, oh man, I've been there. If you have, we need to talk later. You've got this picture of somebody who is suffering because they don't have something that needs to be provided for them. And then guess what? Somebody comes along and says, there's a better way. I bring good tidings of great joy that, will bring, that I bring to all people. And it comes at the low, low price of three payments of $14.99. And you look at the commercial and you're like, what is this life-saving technology that you've come up with? It's a bowl that you can microwave eggs in. That's not a solution for my life. That's just another thing that's going to give me gross eggs and I've got something else to lose in the Tupperware cupboard. 
That's not the solution that I'm going for. You've overpromised what you can do for me. My problems aren't solved. And this is remarkably similar to the way that we can misunderstand Romans 8.28. Do you have problems in your life? Here's a verse that says if you convert, everything in your life suddenly becomes better. But here's what Scripture actually teaches. Within the concert of all Scripture, living within God's wisdom will very likely lead to you having a less complicated life because following God means that we're not indulging in sin. It could be less complicated, but it doesn't mean that our problems go away. We always need to remember that when reading the promises of Scripture, our understanding needs to line up with the whole of Scripture. If you take a look back at Romans 18, 17, you'll see that Paul says this. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Awesome. But if we are to share his glory, uh uh-huh, we must also share his suffering. Ooh. As followers of Jesus, yes, we are invited to share in Jesus' glory with him. But to do so, we also need to recognize that in order to share in the glory of Jesus, we need to live a life like Jesus. We're going to share in his sufferings as well as his glory. In his time on earth, Jesus never, ever undersold the price of following him. We've been going through this in Matthew for pretty much the better part of this year. However, he, he always said, in relation to the price of being made holy, he said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Yes, being a disciple is simple. But he never promised that it was going to be easy. He never promised it was going to be charmed. In Luke 9, when someone says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus doesn't respond by telling him about the signing bonus that he gets for becoming a disciple. Foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. If we understand our love of God as a transaction, if I love you, then you give me nice things. If we understand our love of God as a transaction where we follow him in exchange for protection from misfortune or unpleasantness, then we've misunderstood God's promise. We aren't called to live safe. We are called to share in Jesus' suffering so that we can also share in his glory. God is not interested in our comfort. He is interested in redemption. It's another thing to be aware of when it comes to that kind of a belief. Believing that God wants us to live lives of comfort and ease establishes the inverse of that statement as well. Suffering implies that we are far from God. Suffering implies that there's something wrong with us. That belief sets us up to judge others in a way that is unfair and unbiblical. It also sets us up, if we're experiencing hardship, to be very confused. In the story of Job, we see a righteous man who experiences disaster and loses everything short of his life in the process. And then his friends come along and they try to make sense of the situation by telling him, Job, you had to have done something wrong. God doesn't just go and visit punishment on people for nothing. What did you do? Confess, and it'll be fixed. If we honestly believe that God has promised us freedom from pain in exchange for loving Him, what's the natural assumption about people who we see who are suffering? They're far from God. If we misunderstand this promise of Scripture, we have the potential to do so much harm to the people who need the love and compassion and mercy of Jesus in those moments. If our solution to somebody is, just get right with God, 
there's a part of that for sure. When you look at James 5 and it says, if there's any sin and you need to confess it and you will be healed, there is definitely a part of that. But we have so much potential to do so much harm to people who are suffering if we tell them, this is going wrong in your life, then you need to get right with God. There are some people who are walking closer with God than we are who are suffering mightily. Part of following Jesus is living like him. So we should all experience, expect to experience some things to pop up in life somewhere along the line. And when those things pop up, understanding that God's, not interest is, God's first interest is not our comfort but our redemption helps to give us the strength to be able to s- walk through those challenges without losing sight of God's love and sovereignty through it all. And here's another potential misunderstanding of this promise. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay, so we believe that. So here, the misunderstanding that we could possibly have is if we experience loss or if we experience tragedy, that God is waiting in the wings to provide something better to replace it because he works for the good of all those who love him. Here's kind of what that logic looks like. Imagine that you've been working at your job for 15, 30, 45 years, whatever it is. And things seem to be going well until suddenly, from out of nowhere, the rug gets pulled out from under you and you lose your job at a time where you cannot possibly lose your job. Well, if we look at this promise from the perspective that, well, if something happens, then God is going to provide something better, then that person needs to be on the lookout for a better job that God is wanting to provide for them, right? Maybe. That could be comforting, and it might happen. We don't know. But for somebody who's experienced a job loss, if we tell them, "Eh, when God closes a door, he opens a window, sometimes that can be Encouraging for somebody in that kind of a situation, but try to apply that logic to something else if the circumstances are different. Say somebody is engaged to somebody else and they're madly in love with them. When suddenly the fiancé breaks off the engagement and it seems like it's for no reason. Well, if we're going to follow this logic, then we need to be able to go and say to that person, well, God has somebody better for you. There's somebody better than the person that you were madly in love with. I don't know if God has a better partner in mind for that person. He might not. What do you tell the person who's struggling with depression? What do you say to somebody who's experiencing chronic pain? What could God possibly provide to you that could make up for the loss of a, of a loved one. The logic breaks down pretty quickly and his promise starts to sound very hollow in the hearts of people who experienced real tragedy. This is what I see in Scripture. That when it comes to those tragedies, when it comes to the things that we go through, I see in Scripture that God grieves with us when we are in pain. Jesus wept with Mary and Martha when their brother died. God mourned the evil that he saw in the world before he approached Noah. God cherishes the people who are in pain, who are persecuted, who hunger and thirst for justice. Saw that back in Matthew 5. Through Jesus, God has experienced all of the things that we experience. And he can relate to our pain. If we believe that God allows loss and pain so that it can be replaced with something better, then we again have the potential to harm people who are suffering. And we have the potential to put ourselves into situations where we are very confused. Where we can very easily lose faith, lose heart, lose sight of God's providence. Pain and loss are a result of sin 
in the world. And God grieves with anyone who grieves. Suffering and loss are not necessarily doled out in relationship, in relationship to faithfulness. They come to everyone. Through it all, though, you can be assured that God still loves you. You don't need to lose sight of that. And you can trust that God is still causing everything to work together for the good of those who love him according to those who are called by his purpose. And I believe he does this by his redemptive nature. I believe that no matter what we've experienced, no matter what we've gone through, no matter what we are currently going through, that God is able to redeem all of it. If you go all the way back into the book of Genesis, you'll find the story of Joseph. And it's a fascinating story that starts, or it's a fascinating story when you start breaking it down. And it all begins with a very, very, very dysfunctional family. Joseph's father, Jacob, has children with four different women, and he's only married to two of them. I barely remembered my one anniversary this year. Dysfunction. Jacob plays favorites and makes it very clear that he loves Joseph more than he loves the rest of his brothers, causing jealousy. He plays favorites with his wives, which causes them to start competing with one another. More dysfunction. And the situation isn't helped when Joseph tells his brothers about his dream of ruling over them someday. It just ingrains that jealousy. After Joseph tells them about this dream, the brothers decide that they've had enough and they plan to kill him. But they walk that plan back a little bit and they just sell him into slavery. Way better. Dysfunction. Probably not what God would want for their lives. Joseph then faithfully serves his new master until he's sent to prison under false accusations. I did everything right and now I'm in jail. He then spends years forgotten in prison until he's called out to prepare the country that he's in a foreign land that he's been brought to against his will for a coming famine that ultimately puts him in a position to save his family. Great. The story ends on this note in Genesis 50, 20, where, he said, where Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended all of it for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And when you look at that story, there are a lot of things that fall way outside of God's intended purpose for this family. The violence, the pain, the dysfunction, they all run contrary to God's character. I imagine that Joseph would have had quite a few nights as he was lying in prison, as he was lying as a slave, even as he was being transported to Egypt. He would have had many nights where he would have lied awake and he would have wondered to himself how a loving God could allow so many things or could allow him to go through so much hurt. He carried the consequences of his brother's cruelty for a long time. He would have still borne the scars from his time as a slave. He couldn't recover the years that he lost in prison. He wasn't getting those back. He didn't recover the years that he'd spent away from his father. However, God is so powerful that he was able to work through the brokenness of that family and the circumstances of Joseph's life to redeem it for his purpose. It won't always end the way that Joseph's story does. In Acts 17, we see the story of Stephen, who was a faithful follower of Jesus, young man. And he was stoned to death by the religious leaders in Jerusalem for not recanting his faith. He didn't get a happy ending to his story. And his death was just the beginning of a wider persecution of the church. It was awful, but God was able to still even redeem that situation. For Stephen, the way that God redeemed Stephen's story, God gave him a vision of his salvation and he was assured of his place by God's side. 
for the other believers that he left behind, the persecuted church. That persecution that started in Jerusalem actually started the dysphoria of Christians around the Roman Empire. It scattered them to the different corners, and they took the gospel message and their faithful witness with them wherever they went. From that tragedy, God redeemed it. For Stephen, he saw his salvation. From the persecution, the word of God spread. In a world that is broken by sin and where things constantly run contrary to his character, God is in the business of redemption. There is incredible hope in that message. This is what I want to leave you with. If you're a follower of Jesus, you can trust that God is sovereign in every season season of life that you'll face. We're going to experience hardship and suffering. That's inevitable. Sometimes it's going going to come as a result of our decisions, sin in our lives. I've got plenty of experience with that. I know the consequences of things that I've done. That's not God's purpose for our lives. God did not intend me to walk away from him. It's the result of sin. The good news, though, is that while my sin was not God's plan for my life, He can still redeem my story. While the things that have happened to you, the things that you may have caused, the things that you have gone through may not have been God's purpose for your life, God can still redeem your story. I have a story to tell of what I have been saved from, and I'm sure that you do too. God can work through our past and use it for his purpose because God can redeem anything. There are also going to be times where suffering comes as a result of the brokenness in our world. We're experiencing this right now. We see this all over the place. We've all been through a two-year pandemic together. We're seeing war going on in other parts of the world. We're seeing division happening around us. Aside from the things that are global and the big things that we see in our lives, it's all those little personal tragedies that we've seen in our lives. Things that have come about not by any fault of our own, but because we live in a fallen world. And some of you have stories with that because you have been to the lowest places that you can possibly be. Some of you have experienced tremendous loss or tragedy that came out of nowhere and you were left confused and hurt asking how a loving God could have a purpose for what you're going through right now. You might be able to relate to Psalm 22 where the psalmist cries out wondering where God is and why God feels so distant. I want to assure you that whatever you have gone through or whatever you are going through, God loves you. Don't lose sight of that. God loves you and he is mourning and grieving alongside you. And you need to know that pain and confusion, suffering, the things that you may be experiencing, they're not his will for your life. But much like the story of Joseph and the persecuted early church, God is powerful enough to redeem your story. Your experience is painful. Your experience may have been painful or it may continue to be painful. And it may leave you scarred. But God is still able to nurture hope and salvation through many, through your story. As a church, we need to remember that the purpose we've been called to, bringing the hope of salvation to the world, as we do that, we need to remember that we can trust that God will fulfill his purpose no matter the circumstances because God is able to redeem all things. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called 
according to his purpose for them. This is the message that we can find comfort in. This is a message that we can find comfort, hope, and purpose in no matter the circumstances. We can trust that in the middle of our troubles, in the middle of the things that life throws at us, even in our own brokenness, we can trust that there is hope and confidence that we can carry into our world because God is able to redeem all things. We can bear anything along with the God who loves us. As we do that, we carry that hope and purpose around with us and we show others what it looks like to be an authentic follower of Jesus no matter the circumstances. I invite you to pray with me. God, as we close our time together, Lord, I want to ask that you would have your mercy fall on us right now. Lord, this is a difficult thing to hear if you're going through something. If there's an illness or if there is conflict or if there is tragedy or if there are things that are worrying or whatever else may be going on in our lives. It's hard to imagine how, God, you could possibly redeem any of these things that we see. God, I want to ask that you would help us to have faith. Faith that is focused on you and not the things that we can see or control. That, God, we would be able to submit the situations of, or the, the circumstances of our life to you. That regardless of what's going on, that, Lord, we may be able to authentically witness before people that all things work to the good of those who love you and are called to your purpose. Jesus, it may look so different than what we expect victory or good to look like. Remind us, God, that your greatest victory came as you suffered on the cross. Remind us, God, that you can redeem anything that we go through. Help us, Lord, to con- commit our lives to being that authentic witness to others. Lord, give us faith to know that you are able to redeem all things. Pray it now in your name, Jesus. Amen. I've got one last song that I want.